Your business needs help. 56.1 million employees are employed by small businesses in the United States, and 99% of all U.S. establishments are small businesses under 250 employees. That means that your business should be listening to the only podcast dedicated to small business success. That's Growth Success Radio, growthsuccessradio.com. Welcome to this week's episode of Growth Success Radio. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Growth Success Radio. This is episode 14 of Growth Success Radio. It is Friday, November 20th, 10 a.m. Eastern. I am Scott Gumbar, your co-host for Growth Success Radio, the only blabcast that focuses on small business growth and success. This week we are going to be talking to Adam Blumner, he helps businesses determine what is the best software for their business, uh, you know, depending on the, the uh, type of business, the size of the business, and uh, what software will work best. Uh, once again, I am Scott Gumbar. I am one of your co-hosts. The other co-host is on his way in. Um, I do digital marketing, which means that I help businesses find highly qualified clients using the internet, such things as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, Instagram. Uh, I'm an SEO specialist. I am a Google certified partner. Uh, I also do internet advertising, so primarily Facebook and Google. However, I will advertise on other platforms as well. And uh, hopefully our guest will arrive shortly. Okay, I just got an email from Adam. He's on his way. Uh, and my co-host, Eugene, will also be on shortly. So while I'm waiting for the two of them, let's discuss some updates. One of the updates that uh, in the social media world, Google Plus, has made some changes to their layout. And uh, <clears throat> for the better, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I'm, I don't like it at this point. Here's what uh, we're looking at is that, first of all, they've, from, from what I can tell, it looks like they've actually separated the personal profiles from the business accounts. So if you were like myself, you managed some business pages through Google+, which you have to for the Google 3-pack, then, and there's my guest, uh, Adam. So Adam, just click on open seat. Thank you. Um, so if you <coughs> were like myself and you managed Google+, um, pages through your personal account, you no longer can directly connect. Good morning, Adam. How are you? Adam, can you hear me? Sounds good. Oh, what is your centralized location? The address for your centralized location. Adam, can you hear me? Sounds good. All right. And I just don't want to bring back software systems that are way out of the realm of what you're looking for based on price. So do you have a, a generally a range or budget you'd like to see? Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? I don't know if you can hear me. All right. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Doesn't sound like Adam can hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Oh, definitely. You know, what we have developed here is my company. Okay. So... Just allows me to take a look at your requirements. So we are live in. Uh, you're looking for three concurrent users. All the functionalities include basic setup costs and first year of support. So, so Eugene, while we're working this out, you want to introduce yourself and Trigger Insurance? We're looking at three concurrent Yes, so I am Eugene Rosinski. I'm co owner of Trigger Insurance. I act currently as the president of. Hi, Eugene. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Ends that appear to be an excellent fit for you within that range. Are you comfortable taking a look at those? Can you hear us? If I do find a system that you know meets all Adam, can you hear us? 
Well, it looks like it jumped out. So go ahead, Traeger Insurance. Yep. I co-own it. Um, currently serve as the president of commercial lines. So basically I focus on finding insurance solutions for businesses. Some of the businesses I work with currently are moving companies. And we have an art studio working on a pharmacy as we speak. So we have a broad range that we're able to find coverage for. Nice. All right, are you able to hear us now? Still can't hear us. Yeah, I can hear that. The most important thing about that email that I'll send out to you is there will be a link to your software buyer's guide within that email. That buyer's guide link will be updated. So, Eugene, I was talking about Google+. Plus. Uh, they've changed their their layouts and uh, they've disconnected the personal accounts from the the uh, pages now, and so that's that's presenting a challenge for myself anyway, where I'm not able to directly connect. Now I have to actually type in a URL, and you know, I'm lazy, so if I have to type in an extra website, that doesn't work. Uh, on top of that, the pages, you know, they they have this link to. Okay, you can't hear me. Um, Let's see, just trying to work on getting the, uh, I think I have an idea here. The, when you, when, you know, you have that link, whenever they have the new layout, they say to try the new layout, you click the link. Well, I click on the link and it just goes crazy on the pages, so uh, not, not uh, impressed with the Google Plus changes. And this one will skip you. I don't know, did you make it to uh, the Big Connect yesterday? No, I had like three appointments set up yesterday before I realize it was a big connect so I was there and I don't know if you've heard of Facebook moments or if I've talked about it before nope. um, but Facebook moments is an app that you can put on your phone so anytime you take pictures you can share the pictures with specific individuals on Facebook so okay. I did that yesterday while I was at um, big connect I took a couple pictures of Marnie in her booth and mm -hmm. Facebook moments pops up and says do you want to share this picture with Marnie so it knew I was taking a picture of Marnie that's scary. That is a little scary. There's a little face facial recognition going on there. Uh, Adam, are you able to hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, but I don't know if I'm. I see a comment about uh, some background noise. I don't know if I'm contributing to that. Yeah, it almost sounds like somebody else is on the phone or something. Yeah, it's gone though. I don't hear it anymore. Okay. okay. Um, Eugene, any updates in the insurance world? Yeah, so I just, today I just want to talk about telematics. So I'm not sure if anybody knows, but those are basically the devices that most companies now have you install in your car. Um, a lot of times now, if you install that device, they give you some type of discount or one company in particular will waive an accident or surcharge. So the reason why I want to talk about it is that those devices are soon going to become not just hey if you do this to get a discount but it's going to become mandatory so i just want to put that out there for the world that within the next few years most companies will make it mandatory that you install that device in your car so they can track your driving so within the next two years and one day somebody will hack them basically because right. they all have gps signals they all have all types of they're basically mini computers now nice uh adam Yes, sir. Welcome. Uh, so, Adam Bloomer, you are a, uh, you help businesses find the appropriate software for them, right? Is that right, or can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, in a nutshell, that's kind of the uh, the base of it. Find accounting software has been around um, since before two thousand. Um, obviously, uh, it, the uh, the type of software, as you could tell, with accounting software is centered on that. Um, but it's really not exclusive to that. It's kind of an umbrella term. So, um, you know, it could include anything from, say, uh, CRM software, inventory control, payroll, supply chain, invoicing, um, all sorts of different business management software. Basically, we have a service where uh, if, if you're looking for some software for your company, we provide uh, essentially free consulting to get you matched up with the most appropriate options. Um, so the, we work with a, a network of different software sellers who pay us uh, to be affiliated with the service. So on, the, on that side, kind of in that direction, it's a lead referral service. Okay. So what, uh, what brought you into that world? 
Uh, well, that's interesting. I mean, I had started off um, in uh, a couple of different technology sales positions, and uh, I was moving back from Chicago. I'm originally from Wisconsin, where the company is uh, is based, and um, you know, read a really interesting job description, uh, looking for somebody who had some technical background to uh, assist with these sort of uh, software searches and um, who could uh, play this kind of consultative role. Um, so, you know, spoke with the company. It sounded like a really intriguing kind of unique business model and something that, uh, that I wanted to get into. So I've been with the company actually since 2004. Wow. Okay. That's a long time. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Congrats on uh, 11 years. Yeah, I know. I, I can, I can hardly believe it. I mean, it's uh, time flies. Good sure it does. Time yeah. does fly. All right. So what type of criteria um, do you use to rec to find people the proper software? Yeah, so I mean, it's really interesting. There's actually um, thousands of different packages out there. I mean, I think uh, at last count, we have something like, you know, 6,000 uh, different programs listed on our software directory at Find Accounting Software. Uh, so there's all sorts of um, kind of different dimensions in which they vary. Obviously, you've got uh, you know, the foundation, what is the software looking to do? What's the, you know, kind of the main uh, feature or benefit that it's providing? Uh, but software varies by price point, uh, by deployment method. Are you looking for something hosted? Are you looking for something you would run internally? Um, what kind of operating systems? What's your price point? Um, all sorts of different factors play into that. And, and really kind of our role is just to understand those things and take what might be a list of, you know, if you go out to the internet and search, say, CRM software, you might get 300 different product hits out there. Uh, but, you know, which of those are really going to be relevant for you? It might only be, you know, 10, 15 options. Um, and how do you get down to a manageable number of, say, three to five different options that you can actually uh, take a look at and have some confidence that these are going to be relevant? Yeah, I, I ran into that recently with a client of mine who was trying to integrate a CRM with his website and uh, it w we went through a few options before he finally narrowed it down to one so that's uh, you know CRMs are definitely there's they're a dime a dozen for sure you know you you have your sales force out there but then everything after that it's like uh, which one is, which one is going to work best for the business yeah um, so what what do you look at the size of the company at all or uh, their their budget their income yeah, I mean, certainly um, the, the size of the company is going to be a big factor, but, um, you know, it, it really all kind of depends on the business model. I mean, you could have, um, you know, a company that maybe has, uh, you know, 50, 100 people, um, say a manufacturing company, and a lot of them are going to be on the operations side, and uh, maybe you've only got a, 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 you know, a sales team of five or six individuals. Uh, well, they might actually need a product that's very similar to, you know, a product that is used by a 10-person company but happens to be, um, you know, a marketing company or a manufacturer's rep or something like that. So um, size is certainly a dimension, but a lot of it comes down to, uh, you know, user counts, transaction volumes. Um, you know, certainly you want to look at things like uh, how, much, how much time is going into uh, – the different processes that you're looking to get some automation for. I mean, ultimately, that's what what software is is trying to do is give you something that uh, maybe you've got some processes for, but uh, how do you compress that? Have them, you know, amount to less time so you can spend more of your time, you know, doing those revenue generating activities that you're trying to focus on. Awesome. How do you? What marketing methods do you use to? get new clients and does your company have like a in-house type of marketing efforts leads generation for you guys to find uh, clients yeah um, so basically everything that we do is completely inbound um, at least in terms of connecting with the software buyers um, so all of those uh, buyers basically what we've done is we've set up uh, findaccountingsoftware.com uh, okay. We are, I mean, heavily invested in content marketing. I mean, basically what we're looking to do is provide really top-notch resources to somebody who might be looking to purchase software. So that kind of starts with the uh, directory and the different classifications and categorization 
of these different products that are out there. Um, but then we also author, you know, lots of kind of in-depth articles about how you want to approach a selection process, um, what you should be looking for, um, what you may want to be considering in the process. Do you need to work with a, you know, a, a company who is who is local to you? Do you need to consider it? Consider, Scott, I heard you mention before with your clients that uh, they needed to integrate that CRM package. Uh, well, what kind of expertise um, should you be looking for? when you're purchasing the software in terms of what the provider has um, in order to, you know, assist with that. So uh, there's all these different resources there. And then the really kind of the second uh, uh, foundation of the inbound marketing that we do is we've, uh, I mean, since the, it really since I think it's probably been around, we've been uh, heavily invested in using, you know, Google AdWords and uh, some other search engine channels uh, to, uh, to, to bring people directly to the site. Now you're talking my language. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I saw that. So how long have you been doing that, Scott? Uh, officially about two and a half years. Unofficially, probably 20 years I've uh, okay. been in marketing. Um, but I'm Google certified partner. I actually just got another email to, to train Google Analytics in New York. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's fun. I'm supposed to go up to Google in Cambridge, Mass. on uh, December 10th. So we'll okay. see. It's a uh, half a day, but we'll see how that goes. Ad, it's all AdWords, so it's uh, one of the things I do. So, um, do, do you have? Do you have? Um, are you providing that kind of as like agency consulting, working with clients? Is that for? Uh, I uh, I do both. So I I'm primarily work with clients as when it comes to AdWords. Um, I'll manage their AdWords account, but I also do consult. Okay. So, Great. Yeah. Um, Adam, so if, if I was a startup business, and I actually am working with a startup business right now and fi of five employees or five uh, partners, however you want to, however you want to uh, dice it up, um, and they were searching for accounting software, what would some of the options be for them? Well, I think in the case of a startup company, um, I mean, one of the things that you're looking at um, in, in that case, and this is always the case, but it's especially true with startups, um, there's a lot of demands on the capital. Um, so kind of traditionally, the model for enterprise or business software has been that you make um, this fairly large expenditure and you get your return on investment in you know the second year, or the third, uh, the third year, or something like that. Um, and a lot of times, uh, startups, especially if they're uh, kind of more in a bootstrapping mode, don't have that option to wait that long. Um, so I think looking uh, for a startup that is in that situation, kind of focusing in on software as a service options, where you're paying more of a you know a monthly subscription fee rather than this kind of big lump sum upfront uh, capital expenditure uh, it is a good way to kind of start the, uh, the search in terms of, you know, setting up what are some of our base qualifications for this. So, okay. so the, the client that you're working with, um, what kind of uh, company is it? Um, the, the details I can't really, really go into yet because sure. there, there's, there are some legal issues that they're dealing with. Uh, but I'm actually a partner in the company, so um, it's a uh, it's a membership type business. I'll just I'll just put that. Uh, okay. I'll just state that it's a membership type business. So, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, already there. One of the things that I'd be thinking about is um, with a membership based business, you've got a very different kind of billing approach um, than what a lot of companies have. Uh, so, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, kind of a foundational business management system, something that's going to give you some ability to manage finances, control sales, um, control um, information that's related to reaching out to customers, uh, maybe even do payroll, those sort of kind of core uh, business things. Uh, the One of the big differentiators in that is going to be looking at programs that are going to support that recurring model of, uh, of right. because a lot of companies out there um, obviously aren't in that mode and it requires some kind of unique functionality and um, a lot of people I think don't recognize that difference they might go out to the uh, the market and start looking for these systems see the uh, capacity to do invoicing, see the capacity to handle the back-end accounting, 
Um, and uh, if you're not paying attention to that, you can find yourself in a situation where, you know, maybe you've, the, the time it takes to be, you know, connecting uh, with, uh, with the uh, people who are uh, subscribing to the service um, and to manage the administrative processes that are related to that uh, can, can be a lot higher than it necessarily needs to be. Right. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we might reach out to you and it's, we're still in the uh, planning stages, but we'll reach out to you probably at some point. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the really cool thing about the way the service works and one of the first things, like I was kind of saying before, that attracted to me is uh, to the business is that uh, it does have that, you know, completely free aspect for somebody who is, you know, in your shoes looking to purchase the software. So uh, we've kind of basically, you know, tried to organize it from the perspective of, okay, if we're a company that's looking to find software, what do we want? So one of the things that we want is we don't want to spend a lot of time kind of, um, you know, sorting through these hundreds of different options. We'd like to get to the meat of it and figure out which ones are, are relevant. Uh, we want some control in this process. We don't want to, you know, hear from, have our names go out to 20 or 30 different companies and all of a sudden lose control of, um, you know, the, uh, the sales process and have all these inbound calls uh, coming that are, are, are going to be overwhelming. So, you know, th basic things like that, uh, being able to, you know, define how many people you want to hear from, uh, kind of cut to the chase uh, with, uh, with getting right to more relevant options. Um, those are things that we've always uh, tried to pay attention to and uh, kind of shift and shape the service to, uh, to, to do as well as we can with those. Okay. So the things of a question, how does your company uh, generate revenue? Sure. So what is the business model that your company uses to generate revenue? Is it kind yeah. of like a broker fee you charge or how does that work? Well, so what we do is we're also doing a, a subscription um, type of model. So if there's a company who is looking to sell their software, uh, one of the things that becomes difficult with this type of software is because there's so many different types out there, um, using standard pay-per-click uh, type approaches can be very difficult to do because there's so much noise um, in relation to the signal of what you're uh, being able to bring in. So for instance, let's say you're a company who sells um, budgeting software. Well, a lot of the people who are going to be doing it, even a highly targeted search like budgeting software, um, are going to be looking at it for, you know, personal purposes, or maybe they're looking to, um, you know, uh, learn about the software because they're searching for a job or, um, you know, any number of different things. So we kind of add another level of qualification on that and actually drill it down to finding out, okay, who who is this person? Are they actually a business that's looking to purchase software? Do they have, you know, to needs where they need to integrate with another system that, that might determine what kind of software is relevant? So essentially this is all to say that what we can do is if a company is very targeted to a particular type of um, opportunity, we can let them know that, hey, we can, we can give you, you know, 50, 60 leads uh, to take a look at. You can tell us the 10 or 15 that you're interested in um, and really just kind of pay for those ones. So uh, that's the appeal to a company that's actually selling software, why they would want to, uh, to partner with the service, pay the subscription fee. Um, and kind of move forward in that sort of relationship. So we have a, um, I think it's more of a comment than a question, but he sure. can probably elaborate. Uh, Spy Gadget Rentals says, hosted and Bitcoin compatible should probably have an app for mobile devices. We currently use Quicken and QuickBooks. I run a small biz with two to three people. So uh, this is something I actually looked at uh, fairly in depth. I wrote um, a two-piece um, article about um, how Bitcoin uh, might affect some of the accounting challenges and how it would play into the types of software that's needed. Uh, when I was looking at this, I believe it was about a year ago that I had uh, um, written this article, um, I was noticing that there were uh, not a lot of programs that were kind of set up to deal with that. Uh, certainly, you need something that's going to be uh, multi-currency capable. In terms of coming up with a couple of names, um, 
it's it's eluding me at the moment because we don't actually hear from that many folks uh, who have this need. Um, but uh, what we would do is, you know, I'd certainly invite you to do this if, if you wanted us to get a search underway. Uh, we'd find out a little bit more about, uh, okay, what, what accounting processes need to be supported? Do you need to do things like invoicing? Um, we would get a search underway. So basically we would... Um, send out a description of these requirements, a description of your business that was anonymous at that point, ask our network of, it's about 1,200 different sales organizations that we work with to let us know, hey, do you have a solution that you think is a good fit here? Um, and we would generally hear back from some number of them, might be, might be two, might be three, might be five, might be 20 uh, different companies, and we would kind of apply some matching criteria uh, to bring back the top options, but uh, I think the, uh, the 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 software market right now is really just kind of catching up with um, with the cryptocurrencies. So mm -hmm. it would it would certainly limit the number of options, especially if it's a if it's a smaller business. So I heard you say search a few times. Um, how long does that search typically take? So this is something that we actually um, have recently kind of compressed. Um, when we started the business back in you know, 2000, um, it was a day turnaround, right? So we'd have a conversation. Um, we would put together our notes, our summary of these requirements, send it out first thing the, uh, the next morning. Um, the, uh, the providers would look at those needs, let us know if they've got a good solution, and come back and, and let us know. So it would be about a day turnaround. Um, oh, okay. That was probably fine for, you know, the early 2000s, uh, but people are looking for some quicker answers. Uh, so we've actually moved to a model just this year where we're uh, doing the, the searches uh, usually within a few hours. Uh, it kind of depends if you would hit us, say, you know, at the end of the day, it might go out the next morning, but uh, we've tried to compress it into a, a few hours to bring back some options. I was going to say a, a day doesn't seem bad at all. I would think days, yeah. but that didn't seem bad at all. You mentioned 12, yeah. 12 companies. I figured it might take a while, but a day, I'm, I was impressed with a day. And you're talking about a couple hours, so that's pretty impressive. Well, so I mean, this actually brings me kind of around to uh, the thing that I had actually um, reached out to you originally about, Scott, which is we had actually done that study where we looked at um, our call history. Uh, mm -hmm. So we obviously have all these um, inbound um, requests coming in to us from software buyers, right? And they're saying, Here, here's what my requirements are. Um, and then what we do is we have a team of software specialists um, who call out to those folks and talk to them about their, their requirements. Um, so what we had done in that study is we had uh, looked at how does the time that, uh, that the time interval between when they have submitted their requests versus when we've actually followed up uh, affect our contact rates, um, and that's where we saw some pretty uh, some pretty crazy uh, numbers in terms of uh, of what we're able to accomplish. With I'm just actually kind of looking off to the side here because I wanted to uh, to kind of quote uh, a couple numbers for you here. Yeah, so for in so for instance, if we get on the phone with somebody who has submitted one of these requests uh, within one minute, so immediately we're you know, reaching out and calling back, 58% uh, of the time we're going to talk to that person on the phone. Uh, if we wait four hours, that drops to 33% of the time. So, I mean, it's almost double uh, the contact rate if you can if you can touch base with them, you know, within just a couple of minutes. Yeah, that's interesting. So, the, uh, the and now these people are calling you, or are they is there a contact form they're filling out, or is it both? Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, it's really both, but everybody submits um, where it all starts is, is with a contact form, right? Uh, and I think that's something that's, you know, pretty standard for all sorts of different businesses. I mean, whatever kind of business that you have, I mean, there's a pretty good chance that your website uh, has a request for information uh, form on there. So for us, uh, we're making, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of calls um, every year to follow up on these. I mean, we get thousands of searches underway. Uh, so we need to do everything that we can to be as efficient um, and effective uh, at getting on the phone with, with people. So that's that's kind of why we studied this, why we put together that piece. And, um, you know, certainly if we can double our contact rate uh, by getting on the phone within a few minutes, it's something that we're going to, you know, make every effort to do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. no, you so got any other? Go ahead. 
portion. Sure. Um, is there a fee to the consumer to use your mm -hmm. service? So if they go and fill out the form, you guys, you know, go out find software, is there a fee associated that you guys charge for doing that for them? No, uh, there's never any fee. Um, there's never any, never any sort of obligation to purchase or anything like that. Um, I mean, really, the only thing we would ever ask is um, we we would just ask that hey, we're gonna we're gonna reach out to you know hundreds of these different companies, ask them to have a live person uh, read through your requirements, and we're gonna bring back however many options you want to take a look at. So if that's you know two or three or four or five, uh, whatever it is. Um, we'll actually have them follow up with their recommendation and reach out. So we hope that you would just take the time to speak with them. Uh, but, you know, if you're not seeing, if you're a buyer and you're not seeing what you're looking for amongst their options, uh, you're not under any sort of, you know, obligation to, uh, to purchase one of those choices or, or to pay us in any way. Okay. And just a follow-up question on that. Sure. Does the consumer then, by working with you, since you guys, you know, have, a lot of um, leads for these client for your um, software sellers. Do they get any type of you know discounted rate on the software versus going out to that company directly and getting it from them? Um, yeah, I mean, I do. I think what it really amounts to is the thing that allows you to get the best pricing when you're a buyer is competition. Um, I mean, that's obviously you know, just, I mean, that's a standard market force. And kind of the nice thing about the structure of our service is every time you're a buyer and you're looking to get some options, you're entering, if you work with, a, you know, a service like ours or others are, um, out there like it, um, you're working with a company who is bringing back multiple different uh, providers. So they know they're in a competitive situation. Um, they know that they need to put their best foot forward. In fact, for certain products, I mean, there's, you know, tons of um, sellers of Microsoft, uh, you know, business accounting solutions out there. Sage is another big one. SAP, um, Intuit's uh, line of QuickBooks um, products. Um, you know, we if you're looking to get competitive bids on any of those situations and you actually want to hear from, you know, two or three providers of the same software to find out, okay, which of these is going to give me the best foot forward in terms of price and which is going to have the, the kind of the best technical acumen uh, to kind of support this, uh, this solution or do any integrations that might be necessary, um, you know, we can help with that. So I think, I think it really works well in introducing that sort of competition into the, uh, into the process. So how does your company then make money? How do they, I mean, you got to make money to, to s stick around. So, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, each year the, um, the, the different companies who are selling software, they're going to pay us. Um, essentially, it boils down to a subscription fee to be affiliated with the service. Good idea. Uh, so what happens is there's a bunch of different ways you can kind of split it up and, and, and partner. So if you're looking for just to talk with local companies, um, you know, it'd be a different level of membership and price uh, for the subscription. Um, if you're looking to pursue people who, you know, might have be larger companies and uh, have larger requirements, larger budgets, um, there's going to be a different level of membership that you would partner with. Um, so there's all these different kinds of ways that the service is set up um, and, and the level of partnership varies, but it really breaks down to people paying that subscription fee. Uh, and then again, I kind of mentioned this in passing before, those companies, they do have the opportunity to select which projects that they work with. We're not trying to shoehorn any buyers or sellers together. In fact, that would be you know counterproductive. So every time a seller um, is matched up with somebody, it's because they've specifically raised their hand and said, yes, I've, I've read through their requirements. I do have a good solution to meet these requirements. Um, find accounting software. This is what it is that I, we propose talking to them about. Um, and if, you know, if we're amongst the top ones in terms of your match criteria, uh, you know, we would like to talk to these people. That's awesome. That's a good business model. So you're not, at the end of the day, you're not uh, dinging the business you're you're really just charging a fee to help find best software, you're, and you're charging the software companies. Right. So really, the business is the beneficiary. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, you know this being on the inbound uh, marketing side, Scott. I mean, it's difficult if you're a company to do outbound marketing. I mean, it's it's hard to be making those outgoing calls. I mean, it's, uh, from what we've seen, this is just a much more cost-effective uh, way for companies to do this rather than maybe hiring somebody who's got to be on the phone to you know, make 100, 200 calls a day, um, and somebody that you're going to be able to pay to make 100 or 200 outgoing, outgoing cold calls, are they going to have the technical and business um, IQ to be able to talk to a buyer of this sort of sophisticated software in a way that's meaningful to them? Um, I think that's, you know, it's a challenge to kind of find that sweet spot um, of somebody who'd be willing to do that who carries those sort of skills. It's very true. Yeah. So for your, for your company, what, what's been the best source of business? What channel of marketing? Well, uh, so, I mean, I kind of talked before about the, uh, the SEO and the SEM in terms of uh, bringing in the software buyers. Um, the company actually, the way it started was uh, it used to actually run trade shows to bring together buyers and sellers. Um, so because of that, there was the knowledge of the market of who's out there um, and some relationships that kind of formed the base of it. Uh, but since then, I mean, we use a lot of things like uh, LinkedIn and uh, different groups uh, that are available um, where, pe where you know, people who are selling this software kind of come together to discuss it. Uh, you know, our sales teams uh, certainly are keeping, you know, their, their fingers uh, on the pulse of, of those different channels and looking to identify different software companies. Uh, another thing that we do is, I mentioned, we have the big uh, software directory with thousands of products on it. So if you're a company who sells or develops software, you can set up a listing for free on the directory. Uh, so there's kind of an inbound um, aspect to that too. So somebody might come to us and say, hey, you know, I'd like to publicize my, my program that we offer. It does document control or project management or accounting or whatever it is. Um, we let them set that up, describe the solution, um, locate themselves in a place where people are coming together with the express purpose of finding out about different options. And then we'll let them know, hey, if you'd like to actually speak with people who have the, the, these sort of requirements, um, you know, we've got a service that we'd be happy to tell you about. Do you find a bigger challenge getting the, the people to go on and submit the form saying, hey, I'm looking for the accounting software or finding the software companies to sign on on your website? or sign on as a uh, as a member? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if one is more difficult than the other. They're just different because when you look at uh, the software companies, um, it's actually a little bit of a, um, it's not, it, it's limited. There's a, there's a kind of a finite number of companies out there who are developing and selling the software. Now, it's not a small number. I mean, there's thousands of companies who are um, selling these sort of solutions. Um, on the buying side, you're talking about any business whatsoever. Um, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be a business. It could be a school. It could be a government entity. It could be a nonprofit. Um, you know, any sort of organization like this has these requirements. So um, that's that is a challenge because there's a lot more variety in terms of what they actually need. Then, whereas the software sellers, um, it's a single kind of standard business model. I shouldn't say a single one, but it's, you know, a, f a fairly uniform business model for how they approach the market. Um, so it's, a, it's potentially a little bit easier to communicate with them um, about that because, you know, we've got one specific thing that we're looking to meet, to use to meet their need, whereas buyers, um, there's, there's a, a much wider range of uh, different kind of interest points that they might have that they're looking for. Yeah, that's why I was wondering, because your business too, to succeed, you need both. You need the software, and then the software companies have to see a benefit because you're bringing in them, the, the consumers that are buying their software. That's right. So that's yeah. why I was wondering what the what do you find more challenging is getting the software companies to stay on or finding the consumers to, you know, use your service to get that software. Yeah, yeah. Um, I spend more time personally working on the side uh, trying to connect with the software buyers. Um, 
So I guess I'm probably a little bit more familiar with the uh, with with some of the challenges um, on that side. But yeah, I mean, it, it, both sides are definitely challenging. So what would you tell someone if they said, listen, um, thanks for referring accounting software to me, mm -hmm. uh, but I have a bookkeeper and the bookkeeper says to use this software? Uh, good question. In fact, I actually, I wrote about this actually recently. I mean, literally uh, this very topic probably about five or six weeks ago. Uh, so first of all, I would say listen to them. Um, if, if you are continuing to actively work with a bookkeeper and expect to outsource um, some of your accounting work to them, um, definitely they should be a person who is, uh, is involved in that decision. Um, now the kind of point that I was making in this article that I wrote was that you need to also uh, kind of take their recommendation, I guess, with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, so their what I mean by this is their motivations um, are going to be slightly different than than your motivations as a buyer, right? As a buyer, what you want is something that's going to give you the maximum efficiency, the maximum visibility into um, your data to make good uh, business decisions, and ultimately the lowest cost when it comes to administrative costs, right? Which you can count accounting, and that's not something mm -hmm. that's generating revenue. It's something that is a necessary cost to, to run your company. Now, the bookkeeper, their primary motivation is to provide a valuable service for which they can be compensated. So um, there may be areas where the more efficient way to approach it is getting software and doing it in-house. And that may be something that the bookkeeper um, is currently providing. Let's use an example of, say, uh, payroll software. Um, not everybody wants to run their own internal payroll software. A lot of companies would prefer, you know, let's just uh, outsource this to an accountant, have them take care of it. It's not our core competency. Um, other people might have, you know, somebody in-house who is totally capable of doing that. Um, and, you know, with some basic software, they can do that inexpensively and, let, you know, at, at less cost than a bookkeeper. So I think that's something that you need to, to kind of keep an eye on. Um, the other thing is I think you need to think about the other aspect of it. So obviously a bookkeeper and accountant is a very specific type of subject matter expert, right? Um, they understand um, finances, they understand the accounting world and how these things are coming together. They may not necessarily understand the technical ramifications of all the different products out there. So for instance, if, um, if you are also going to be using a particular CRM program, or maybe you're a nonprofit who needs to use some fundraising software, um, and you need to be able to create uh, integrations between those programs, so donor, so to continue with the fundraising example, maybe you know donor funds that come in and are recorded through that or brought over into your accounting system. Um, you need to be thinking about things about how those are going to integrate together um, and the technology that needs to be there to support that. That may be something that your accountant or your book mate, bookkeeper is just not a subject matter expert in. So um, I think really how you want to approach it is involve them, um, but make sure that you've got somebody who understands the broader business goals as part of the solution. I don't think it's a good idea to farm it out to you know a particularly junior um, employee because it really can be a big driver of, of cost savings. Um, and make sure that there's somebody who understands the technical ramifications and how that fits into the business strategy. Good. So I just shared the link to the uh, the case study that you referenced earlier for everybody. Yeah. Um, you want to give us a short synopsis of that, or? Yeah, sure. I mean, so uh, we we hit on it before. I mean, basically, what we did is we looked at um, over sixty thousand calls that we had made. Um, I forget exactly what the period of time it was that uh, we had made these calls over. But again, we wanted to find out in terms of the timing specifically um, of these calls and the number of attempts that we are making, how do these affect our ability to optimize what we're getting out of our leads? I mean, Scott, you, you know this again. When you bring in a lead, there's a cost to it. So mm -hmm. if, it's, uh, if, it's a, you know, if it's a lead from Google AdWords, very easy to drill down on that cost to it. If it's um, a result of, uh, you know, content efforts, you know, a blog piece that you've written, maybe it's a little harder to quantify, 
um, the cost for that, but there's certainly a cost that's related to that. So, you know, what we wanted to do is make sure that we were kind of getting the, uh, the maximum um, bang for the buck, um, so to speak, with that. So, you know, again, that first thing that we found was uh, make sure you're following up right away. Um, we actually, so I, I talked before about the contact rates. Uh, we actually also looked at qualification rates uh, in terms of um, how quickly we got on the phone with people. Uh, so for us, qualification means some talking to somebody who says, yes, I'm interested in this. Yes, I want these recommendations. Let's move forward with this process. Um, so when we made our first call, um, and this is going to include both ones where the, the, the buyer picked up the phone and did not. Um, our qualification rate when we reached out within a minute was about 40%. It was 39.6%. If we waited an hour to make that first call, that first call qualification rate coming out of that call with somebody who is moving forward in this process, that actually dropped in half, uh, just about half, to 20.9%. Um, and that's just an hour of time. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, you know, if you're, if you're somebody, if you're an organization who is, you know, invested into inbound marketing, um, I think a lot of times there can be this kind of disconnect uh, between the marketing and the sales groups. And I think everybody kind of like intuitively knows, hey, it's a good thing to get on the phone with people right away. Uh, but it's not always one of those things that, you know, structures and mechanisms and, you know, habits, whatever you want to call it, are, are really cemented into place uh, to do extremely rapidly. And I think for us, at least, it was an eye opener. We had to kind of change our conception of what is fast. Um, you guys mentioned before that, you know, a day for the turnaround of the matching sounded pretty fast. And, you know, that was kind of how we always had approached that particular aspect of it. Well, when it came to calls, you know, maybe I, I, we knew again that getting in touch fast was good, but we didn't realize that, you know, waiting just an hour, maybe we're, you know, working on finishing up, writing the summary of a, a different conversation that we had previously had. We didn't realize that that would be something that could drop that qualification rate in half. Uh, so again, huge, huge eye opener. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good study. Um, I'll be sure to share that when we uh, upload this to the website. But that's so, a really good study. So here, here's another thing we looked at, and I'm interested in um, what you say if you uh, consult with clients about this. And I don't know if this is part of kind of the range of services that you offer. But um, one of the things that we were trying to figure out is, so if somebody sends in an inbound request, right? How many times should we follow up with them before we say, okay, forget it. Let's move on to, to other ones. Um, do you have a standard thing that you kind of... Uh, well, calculate? I've read that average is... Um, a phone call is it's a little different for a phone call, but I, I've read that on average it's seven to ten touches before you close a deal. I yeah. know I know of specific uh, cases where um, I have a friend that it took 43 touches before that person committed. Um, wow. Now, phone calls, I'm not making seven to ten phone calls to someone, maybe two or three at the most. Okay. Uh, because if, they're not, if they don't call back at that point, then, you know, there's not, there's really no interest or they're just not ready. Yeah, so that, that, and that was what we were trying to figure out exactly, too. We wanted to figure out at what point does kind of the, I guess, uh, the, the returns diminish to a point that it's no longer worth it, right? Um, so we looked at that and we actually, there's a, there's a, a chart in the study that uh, relays this information. Um, and we looked at the contact rates for each of the calls that we made. And, you know, obviously not surprisingly, that first contact effort is going to be your best, your best bet at mm -hmm. getting them on the phone. You know, they're, they're, you're, you're never going to have a better shot than that first one. But we found overall, so this is calls of uh, any time interval from the time that somebody had submitted that original uh, request, this is taking into account all of them, we had about a 43% um, contact rate on that. Uh, by the time you got to the third call, let's use that as a benchmark, um, it was only 16% of those calls where we actually talking to somebody. And if you want to go all the way out to like the ninth or the 10th call, uh, we're at about 5% there 
on those calls. So about one out of 20 um, is somebody picking up the phone, at least in our case, um, you know, in, in that sort of situation. So we wanted to kind of figure out, you know, how do we act on this information? What does this really mean? Uh, so one of the things we did is we actually then summed it, right? So we looked at if you get to the eighth call, what is the percentage chance that you that, that you will get in touch with them? So on that first one, it's 43. And if you kind of add these as you move along, I, I recognize this is probably a little difficult to, uh, to do without the chart in front. But uh, if you get to the ninth or the tenth call for us, we found that we were getting in touch with about you know, 78, 79% uh, of the people by making nine or 10 calls um, versus, you know, if you don't stop at that first one, it's 43%. So again, by going to nine or 10 calls, we could double it. If you only go to say um, three calls, um, what we found is it would be a 63% contact rate. Um, so you'd be losing you know, 17% of the people that you would have a chance to speak with um, you know, by not making those additional five or six calls. And I think whether or not that's worth it um, is an individual thing that's going to depend on, on the company, you know, how much time is involved in doing this, what sort of preparation is required. But, um, I, you know, we thought it was interesting to kind of benchmark these uh, contact rates per call attempt to see, you know, at least in our case, what, what do the numbers actually say about it? Yeah, that's good information to have for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from a friend of mine, Devin. He just joined us. Sure. Uh, he's a programmer by, by, uh, um, I don't know, if by default, I guess. I don't know. On okay. average, it takes six and a quarter hours to get the first meeting for a sale. So Devin, um, just so you know, he goes out and meets with different businesses and schools and so forth to see if they want to use his, his software program. Um, okay. And he's actually involved with the project that I referenced earlier, too. So yeah. he's, he's saying on average, it takes 6.25 hours to get the first meeting for a sale. Now, I don't know if that's specifically for him on his own studies. I don't know if he can elaborate on that or if, uh, you know, Eugene might have a, a shorter window to close the sale. I know when Eugene closed my sale, it took 10 minutes. The company that uh, we dealt with took nine months, but um, uh, that's a whole nother blab. <laughs> but, yeah, it's a whole, yeah um, we should do a whole blab on that. So yeah. that didn't take long. So I don't know if that's an average or if that's his average or what, what the case may be. But so that's an interesting stat, too. And I know um, Devin has got a pretty analytical mind as well. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for sharing that, Devin. Yes, average yeah, in general. Okay. Oh, I, sorry, uh, I was just going to say that's great. I mean, I think that kind of dovetails with what we were finding, which is, um, I guess, to, to, to borrow a, um, you know, a search, search marketing term, the kind of the long tail of the call attempts. Um, Devin is, you know, kind of identifying here that at six hours, you need to get into the the long tail of uh, of those call attempts. Yes, they might have lower uh, percentage, of, you know, kind of hit rates there uh, of talking to somebody, but um, you know that's that's average. Um, and you know, we found that obviously you can you can talk to far more people. I mean. Uh, this is basic. If, if you make more calls, you're going to talk to more people. But it's a pretty significant amount just by making uh, a handful of, uh, of more calls. And another really interesting thing that we, we saw is I wanted to kind of benchmark this against, well, what's actually, um, you know, what's happening out there in the market. I found on the call time, um, I found a stat that the average industry follow-up time on an inbound lead is something like 46 hours. Um, so mm. I was talking before about, you know, the difference in calling between one or two minutes versus an hour when the, the kind of the industry averages maybe up to a couple of days. Um, and we saw the same thing. There was, I found uh, some more stats there. These are in the, uh, the study as well, but uh, that, uh, you know, a couple of uh, contact efforts is about the average uh, for most people who are working with inbound leads that, you know, if they're not touching base with somebody after a couple of calls, um, they're going to move on. We found that that would leave, you know, 20, 30 percent of those conversations that you could have with a few more conversations uh, it would leave them out. So um, given the cost, I mean, you got to look at what your cost of acquiring these leads is to figure out, is it worth it? Um, but in our case, at our costs, 
uh, it absolutely is worth it. It's interesting. I think that. Go ahead. For my, no, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So for my industry specifically, when we are, whenever we get an inbound lead, we have to follow up within the first yeah. couple minutes. Because if they're going on our website and filling it out, they're probably on other websites. So we have to hook them in quick. If we wait 46 yeah. hours, that they're gone. They're gone. Right. No way. They're gone. Even if we wait an so, hour. Uh, what, is it, uh, what does your site do? What's the, uh, the service or product? Well, on our, on our uh, website for the insurance, people could fill out a contact okay. form to get a quote. So then that automatically goes, comes in as an email to our info box. And then we look at it. And if it's a commercial, I, ha I will call it. If it's a personal, we have other people that will call it, anybody else in the office. And we usually try to get them within the first couple of minutes because yeah. they're gone after that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, uh, the reality of... Uh kind of, you know, instantaneous expectations. And, um, you know, as more people realize that, you know, like find accounting software, like your business, um, you know, it's it's going to become, I think that effect will only become more pronounced, right? As people get the expectation, hey, I should be hearing from somebody right away and I'm not, what's going on? It's been, you know, five hours since I did that. I think five hours is gonna feel a lot longer um, than maybe it used to. Well, 10 yeah, minutes right. goes a lot exactly. longer now. Because you, you can get anything you need instantly now. So if you don't get the information That's you need within like 10 minutes, then you, you start like shaking. Yeah, like yeah. Draw. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, both of our companies, I mean, obviously you can see um, how there are other resources out there. I mean, certainly there are other places you can do software research, right? There's other um, insurance providers. So you, you need to find... Uh, you need to find the way to uh, to touch base with, uh, with these people right away. Uh, how, do, how do you guys actually do the handle the notifications to get on the phone with them that quickly? Yeah, for, mm -hmm. for our, my company? Um, well, like I said, they, when they go online, they fill out the form with all their, they have to submit all their contact info or else sure. they can't click submit. So then it automatically comes in as an email, we get notification, then we got an email for a quote request, and then we just okay. call them right away. So we have all their info. If we don't get them by phone, we will send them a follow-up email, and then usually we'll try to call them okay. back so the within alert an hour. Just because we know we won't get them. Like if we, unless we get them one of the first people to contact them, we won't get them because if they're going on our, our website, they're probably going so on the alert mechanism websites. for you is the website is just kicking out an email to uh, to the follow up. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, I think it's, you know, it can be something that simple. Um, have you guys heard of, uh, do you guys know what IFT is? IFTT or IFTTT? Oh, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they give you like shortcuts and stuff. No, that's something different. Is that right? No, I, th I think, I think you're on the right thing. So, yeah, so they give you shortcuts and ways to manipulate different software and, Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's not that's not what we happen to use. But I, I every time I think about this and how um, a business might want to kind of easily implement something that would allow them to do this, I, I think of that uh, little service. Um, so for for people who don't know, it's basically it allows you to um, connect different um, software applications. So you could connect. Um, hey, if I get a tweet. Um, you know, I want to also get a, um, you know, text notification sent to me. Or if I'm posting something on Facebook, I want it also to uh, recognize this. And, um, you know, if it's an image, post it to Instagram. Or, or So it's basically kind of a collection of uh, APIs or uh, interfaces between all these different things. So um, you can set it up with, uh, with email too. So you know, if you wanted to even know when you're, you know, driving in the car, hey, I got somebody, uh, you know, coming to the website, um, you could set it up so, you know, that uh, that email that gets kicked out is going to trigger a text message or uh, whatever format works for you. I think it's cool that there are these sort of tools that are out there that allow, I mean, and this is something that's completely free. There's no, there's no cost for it. Um, it's, it's really cool that small businesses have these, uh, these sort of options to use. Yeah, that is, that is a pretty powerful uh, platform. 
I've uh, been meaning to check it out a little more myself. I just haven't gotten around to it. You know, it's always so busy, right? Yeah, I had I had a really funny use case. The way I uh, actually came to it was uh, I was trying to keep an eye on Craigslist postings. Uh, I forget what the product even was that I was looking for. Uh, but basically what it would do is it would constantly be scanning it, looking for a couple of keywords. Um, and when those came up, it would be kicking out an email to me. So, I mean, there's a million different ways you can use stuff like that. Awesome. So we have a quick fire round for you, Adam, and then I wanted to uh, mention a couple other things before we disconnect. But um, uh, Eugene, you want to kick it off? Yes. Adam, what is your favorite business? I'm sorry, what's up? Favorite business? Uh, so uh, the, uh, oh, I'm, try uh, I'm trying to remember the exact name of it. It's uh, the the uh, the lean startup is the name of okay. it. Uh, I don't know if you guys have uh, have encountered that one. I think the author, his name is um, Eric Reese, uh, but it's basically kind of talking about how um, you know taking an iterative approach to startup and constantly evaluating. Okay, it, putting small tests out there before making large scale. Um, you know, investments that lock you into one particular approach or another, um, you know, allows for a much greater, uh, you know, rate of success. That one, I think there's a lot of powerful ideas that it don't even necessarily, I mean, I'm not in a startup business, um, but I, I was thinking about it constantly through reading it about doing different projects, right? I want to try this new, you know, marketing approach here. Um, you know, how do I how do I kind of incorporate these thoughts in, into figuring out a way to make this work? Yeah, there's actually a meetup group here in uh, we're we're about 20 minutes out of New Haven, 20 30 minutes, and uh, there's a, a meetup group called Lean Startup. So, yeah, we. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's your favorite activity outside of business? Golf. Um, it is uh, sadly sadly passing me by right here. I actually I hadn't. I went to answer that way even six months ago. I hadn't played for, you know, since I was in, in my teens. Uh, but I, I took it up this uh, this summer again, and it hooked me hard. So uh, Wisconsin, uh, you know, middle to end of November. Uh, the golf time is done, but I can't wait for it to come back again. We have the same problem here in Connecticut. Yeah. Our, our golf is still gone. Our golf courses are usually open until the first snow. So yeah, we've been lucky snow, so far. The weather's open. been pretty it's good here so far. So, yeah, we're gonna catch some snow, I think, this weekend. Right. So, uh, yeah, I was out uh, about a week and a half ago. You know, I mean, it, it was it was all right. I mean, the the, the leaves are all <laughs> off the trees, but it's still fifty degrees, so it was it was golfable. That's nice, Adam. What is your favorite quote? Pass. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I'm not thinking of one off the top of my head. Oh man, everybody wants to pass on that one. I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, you know what? There, there actually, okay, I, I retract my pass. There's a, so the building that we work in is actually, it's kind of, I don't know if you would call it like an incubator, but it's basically, there's a ton of tech companies uh, that are in the company or in the, in the building, excuse me, um, probably 40 or 50 different companies. Um, and uh, there's a sign above the elevator that I read every day when I come in, and it says, uh, if there's a better way to do it, find it. I think it's a Thomas Edison quote. It's either Thomas Edison or uh, Henry Ford, um, and I think that's great. I mean, that's that's what marketing is all about is, you know, running constant tests, being able, you know, being willing to try things and, you know, being analytical about trying to figure out what works. So that, that one does appeal to me. That's a good one. I'll have to share that to Facebook because everybody thinks they have a better way. Yeah. <laughs> one piece of advice you wish you knew before you got into business. Well, I mean, I uh, I came into this uh, the long way in terms of um, the technology field. Um, I came in, uh, I have uh, English and history degrees. Um, so if I had it to do again, I would go... I, you know, in school, I would uh, I would learn some sort of kind of practical, uh, most likely technical craft to bring into this. I think it just uh, accelerates uh, the career path. Um, so uh, that I, I think that's something that I would do differently. Nice. Okay. So uh, Adam, thanks for joining us. How can people find you? How would they uh, get in touch with Adam? Sure. Um, I would say probably the best way is just to. Uh, I mean, you can go to findaccountingsoftware.com. 
Uh, if you go to the blog, um, I write most of our blog articles, so uh, I believe my contact info it is on there at the bottom of uh, every article, so that's right in there. So findaccountingsoftware.com. Um, you can see the Twitter handle is find my software. Um, we're definitely you know have an active channel there, so um, either of those would be great ways. Awesome. So we will not be on air next week, everybody. We are taking the week off, Black Friday. Eugene already bought his computer, so he doesn't have to go shopping. I don't believe in shopping on Black Friday. I don't know how you feel, Adam, but I don't believe in it. I do, however, believe I'm in uh, this. So please support Small, small Business agree. Saturday for sure. I know that. So get out, you know, forget Black Friday, stay home, recover from Thanksgiving, go shopping on Saturday, go to a small business and support small business because that is the backbone of the United States. Yeah. Um, I do want to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Yay. It is my favorite holiday of the year. Mm -hmm. So please enjoy it. Food, football, family. What what can what more can you ask for, right? Um, again, we're not going to be here next Friday. The following Friday, we're talking to Renee, and her last Wilbur. name is Wilbur. Wilbur. Okay, and she owns Recipro Reciprocity. Reciprocity. I'm not going to say it right. It's like reciprocity, but it's missing a few letters. Uh, and that is a local business kind of social media platform, so it'll, it'll be fun. She's on the West Coast, so she's going to have to get up early for us. Um, any closing thoughts, Adam? No, I mean, I think if you're, at, well, I guess if you are a company that is uh, working inbound leads, I mean, take a look at that uh that study. Um, I will have it on the know, website, growsuccessradio.com. Yeah, yeah, I mean, think about think about how can you set up a process uh, to to make these quicker calls, and how can you figure out you know what's your sweet spot for your uh, particular uh, form of marketing or sales uh, follow up uh, to to find the right number of calls and look at those things. I think will have positive mm -hmm. benefits. And if you need software, um, you know you know where we are, and uh, you know we'd love to help you out. Eugene, any parting thoughts? I want to say happy Thanksgiving to the world. Yes, just happy Thanksgiving. Everybody enjoy their their turkeys and their time with their family. Yeah, no fighting over TVs. Nope. All right, I'm nope. gonna. Thanks everybody for coming on.